Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. I woke up around 5.30 this morning, got a good morning routine done, and I'm raring to go. So let's kick things off with a little bit of things that are happening in the downtown Missoula area. We got progress. We got construction. We even got even more construction with uh, new plans by Northwestern Energy, who will in be investing $10 million on property near Karis Park, which, as you know, is going through construction. So why not doing this synergy thing? Blah, 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 all this stuff happened there. So they want to do a brand new substation, right? Phase one, improvements to Karis Park is now underway, including a renovated amphitheater, widening Karis uh, Clark Fork Trail from eight feet to 18 feet and removing the grass hill. Power upgrades, lighting, and a new plaza were included. For more information, you can go to MissoulaCurrent.com. You can also find out more information about what the city is doing, ongoing projects, upcoming projects through EngageMissoula.com. All right, uh, the Missoulian reported recently that the show Yellowstone has contributed to $70 million for just one season over the course of the year. University of, D of Montana did a study that found that this show has impacted local economies. This series filmed its uh, first three seasons mostly in Utah, but the Paramount Network decided in 2020 to move the show filming to Montana to take advantage of the $10 million uh, film tax credit made available by the Montana legislature. Uh, for those of you who want to be actors, there is going to be another big casting call in Missoula that is happening. You can go, you can email them at YellowstoneExtrasMontana at gmail.com. If you're a Native American, they do Natives of Yellowstone bg at gmail.com. They also have a Facebook page and you can look up casting calls on it and anything like that. You just, just Google it. It's not that hard. Anyways, the uh, 116 um, Montana residents who worked on the show, not including extras, made a combined $3.1 million in wages. Uh, those jobs paid an average of about $66 per hour, but they were not year-round jobs. These are gig work, so for many productions, this doesn't really have much job security, but a nice short-term boost for those looking to work a lot of hours for a short amount of time. So a lot of those guys are going to be walking away. A lot of those folks are going to be walking away with a fistful of dollars. Uh, Montana uh, joined one of 30 states that have some form of tax credit for filming there. About 122 productions were filmed in Montana in 2019, and some of those films qualified for that tax credit. Uh, they were talks about building a $20 million studio, but the company Shadowcast Partners LLC was able to get favor from the Montana legislature on more tax breaks beyond the production costs with tax breaks with make actually filming a movie. So they're building a studio. It's not initially a lot of the same thing when it comes to making a movie and having that tax credit and stuff like that. So there's some loopholes they're trying to take advantage of, but they weren't able to do it. Um, hey, you know, um, you know, it's one of the few uh, shows that it's probably like the only show that's actually filmed in Montana because the actual show Big Sky, which is actually supposed to be about Montana, is filmed in Canada. So 2019 was a great opportunity for Hollywood to invade Montana, but of course the pandemic has slowed down on many things, but it seems like Yellowstone is going pretty strong. I have a friend who uh, was a featured extra in one of the episodes as a, a hippie protester. Anyways, uh, speaking of the pandemic, uh, TSA and all their forms of public transportation have now removed the mask mandates effectively of Tuesday of this week. The Florida judge, uh, federal Florida judge ruled that the mask mandate moratorium in airplanes and public transportation no longer be enforced. And as of Tuesday, every major U.S. airline and major, many airports said that they will no longer enforce face coverings. Uber, Lyft, Coach, USA, Megabus, Greyhound, and Amtrak are no longer in requiring face masks. Um, even at Disneyland, you'll no longer have to wear a mask to hug Mickey Mouse. And speaking of Disneyland, a big controversy that's happening in Florida for Disney World is that uh, he argued, uh, so um, the company, uh, Flor uh, Florida Governor Ryan DeSantos uh, is targeting the company. He argues that the business should not get involved with that controversial don't say gay bill, which refers to teachers that report to parents within six months that their kid may or may not be gay. However, after Disney came out to condemn DeSantis, the governor decided to hold a special session to assess whether the company's uh, CEO, uh, so the, 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 
Okay, so the whole idea behind this is that this special session will look into the 25,000 acres that Disney World acquired back in 1960s. And so basically they had their own governorship. They're, they, they, it's kind of like their own territory. They had a lot of tax breaks, a lot of things like that. Uh, the company employs more than 77,000 workers and annually draws more than 58 million tourists to the state. They pretty much have an autonomy in the two counties the site reaches. Disney's uh, CEO Bob uh, Chapek spoke against the legislation saying that he called DeSantis to express our disappointment and concern that if legislation becomes law, uh, it could be used to target gay, lesbian, non-binary, transgender kids, and all families. Disney later suspended all political donations, hence why we are in this Disney versus Florida, and there are plenty of mad Republicans wanting to take this on this company in Florida as well. And speaking of Republicans, it looks like our own Missou uh, Montana Senator Steve Daines went to Ukraine. Um, St Senator Steve Daines traveled to Kyiv and a butcher last week with Representative Victoria Sparts from Indiana, who is Ukrainian-American, at the invitation of former Ukrainian parliament member. Uh, Daines um, mentioned that Ukraine had a conspicuous absence in the Ukraine of American leadership. Um, he also went as far as to call Putin a terrorist. Uh, Danes is writing up a report in a letter that he plans to send to Biden in hopes that others like him visit Ukraine to, so, to show solidarity. What else, what can we say about the ongoing presence of Western allies in the Ukrainian-Russian uh, conflict? Just recently, uh, President Biden is uh, uh, courting the Senate and the House and the legislature to uh, pass a $800 million, no, $800 million uh, uh, relief for the Ukrainian conflict as well. Um, so in other news, uh, Lviv, oh, actually not in other news, but back to uh, Ukraine, Lviv, a Western city, was bombed over this last week and it killed its very first uh, civilian casualty within this conflict. For those of you not following, Lviv is uh, one of the, has been basically known as one of the safer places for Ukraine. It's very Eastern towards uh, Poland, towards those other countries uh, to the East of it. Uh, no, to the west of it, sorry. I'm getting my uh, thing turned around because I'm about to talk about Mariupol, which is a big topic that's happening within the uh, Ukrainian conflict. Mariupol, the port city near the Black Sea, is under intense fighting, even many Western allies don't think Ukrainian army forces could hold Russia back at this point. Russia told them surrender. They'd say that they will die uh, fighting them off. So they are not gonna stop until the last bullet. Um, recent satellite imagery has also shown potential mass graves on the sites of Mary, outside the outside of the Maripol, and there were confirmed mass graves around the capital city of Kviv. Um, Russia Defense Ministry said that not a single Ukrainian soldier has laid down their weapons and renewed the, pro and renewed the proposal. Ukrainian commanders at Asvastol, sorry, uh, has vowed not to surrender. From what many news stations have been saying, Russian plans to move uh, towards the border and regroup to create a eastern front and push onward rather than the blitz they've already tried and failed to take on many of the major cities in Ukraine. Putin has recently put on the brakes when it comes to some of the places in Mariupol. One of the last strongholds is a steel mill factory, which is uh, what, what I heard on Channel 4 News, which I've been watching that on YouTube to kind of keep up what's happening in Ukraine. Um, they said that this is one of the last holdouts and uh, Putin has also claimed that uh, Ukrainian soldiers are basically uh, using um, civilians as human shields. Uh, that again is, uh, in, there's a lot of people saying this and that. When, when it comes to the people on the ground, there are a lot of people who are trapped in their own hometown, soldiers and civilians alike. At this point, there is no exit ramp for Russia, means no peace and no settlement for Ukraine. I can harp this again and again and again, but if we keep on slow walking into this conflict, eventually we're gonna actually have US uh, boots on the ground, uh, if not NATO getting involved as well. If, I mean, we're technically already involved because we're giving all this money away there and we're basically paying so we don't have to get our hands dirty. So this is what I believe. This is a lot of things happening like that, but going back to Danes, Danes also said in an interview with Capex that it is strength that takes down a bully, not weakness. Weakness invites bullies which led to his bully to the terrorist line, which was one of the headlines on Missoula's Current. So uh, full circle this morning as we dive into uh, an event happening one month from now. Uh, this is an important event. I interview them pretty much every year for the last five or six years. It's the Watchin' Children's Shelter. And so without further ado, here is uh, me with the shaved uh, shorter hair uh, from a couple weeks ago. Hey guys, I'm here with Angie uh, Doucette, and she is with the Washington Children's Shelter. They're talking about Bike for Shelter, which is going on in person this year after two years of, we won't mention 
why? <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the Washington Children's Shelter, what they do. But first, we're going to jump right into Bike for Shelter. What is Bike for Shelter for those of you uh, at home who don't know what it is? Sure. Bike for Shelter is uh, one of our major fundraisers for funding for Washington Children's Shelter. It is a fun, family, free day. And uh, we have a two mile, 10 mile, and this year for the first time, a 20 mile ride, um, utilizing the new bike path out past uh, Lolo and the Traveler's Rest State Park area. And then you'll head back to Community Medical Center at our start finish line. And then we have tons of fun activities for the day. So um, just knowing that it's fun and free for all families to attend on May 21st. And the registration is open now on our website, but you can also register that day if you decide to uh, wake up that morning, head on down at eight o'clock and register for the ride and um, come join the fun. Cool, and where is everyone meeting? Yeah, so we're at the Community Medical Center parking lot right out front. Uh, that's also located in front of one of our homes. So um, if you know where our Fort Missoula home or Ronald McDonald House, we're right on that big lawn right in front. Okay, great. So everyone will gather up. They can register there. People will be biking all over the place, especially since it's next to Fort Missoula Regional Park. People will be able to take advantage of a lot of those trails there as well. Traveler's Rest is quite a trek for a lot of people as well. It's like all the way away in Lolo. Yeah. So that's that's so that's going to be your part of your 20-mile addition. Yeah, so the 10-mile goes kind of past our uh, second house by Buckhouse Lane. So you take Blue Mountain Road. Uh, we'll have mile markers, and we have uh, fans and supporters that will be helping you along the route. But um, you can choose to do a two mile, the 10 mile that kind of goes um, by McClay Flats and um, kind of back around to Fort Missoula. And then, uh, or if you're a heavy duty bike rider, you can just keep on heading out on the bike, tra bike path towards mm -hmm. Lolo and um, head out to Traveler's Rest State Park. We'll have a pit stop there for you. And then you come right back to Community Medical Center to finish up and there's a free barbecue so there's a little bit of an incentive to head on back. We'll have burgers and hot dogs, cotton candy, snow cones, bouncy houses, a rock wall, a petting zoo. Wow. There's a lot of stuff happening. We're excited to be back. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. And at the same time, like we also have to mention like all this is going towards a good cause, the Washington Children's Shelter. And for those of you who don't know, Washington Children's Shelter is a shelter for youth um, under 18 years old and it helps children kind of like, uh, I, I hate to say it like this, but an orphanage, right? Yeah, so we service children infant to age 14 and um, we receive kids in our care whenever they've experienced some sort of family crisis. Um, most children have experienced severe neglect, abandonment, um, and um, sometimes things that we don't always like to talk about. Right. <laughs> so we're that safe place for them to go and we're really just um, honored to be able to help them for the short amount of time that we have them. And so all of the fundraising for this event goes towards um, everything that we give them at Watson. Yeah. And a lot of those kiddos are going to be there, that, right? Um, well, you'll never know. You'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> but we want all kids and families to have uh, fun. So, of course, our kids will be there, but you won't know that they're there. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So uh, where can people find more information about this event? Absolutely. You can go to watsonchildrenshelter.org um, or just Google Watson Children's Shelter and uh, go to our events tab and go to Bike for Shelter and it gives you everything, the maps, registration. We also need a ton of volunteers. So if you feel like volunteering for the morning and then uh, coming back for your lunch later, We'd love to have that too. If you're not a bike rider, but you want to be a cheerer honor, uh, we'll take those people too. And you can volunteer on our website as well. Cool. Well, do you have anything else you want to say about this event that's coming up? Just that we're so excited to be back in person. And um, it's a little overwhelming to have an event not happen for two years in a row. Yeah. So we're a little anxious and excited. And we just want to see everybody out there enjoying uh, Montana, Missoula, and um, supporting us along the way. Oh, thanks, Angie. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
Hey guys, we're back now and we're talking about a couple movies that are coming out this weekend. It's time for Pre-Critic, where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my own biases when it comes to just watching most movies that just come out anyway. So, um, yeah, I mean, I used to have a, a, a less nihilistic approach when it came to movies, but movies just started becoming more and more predictable. I don't know, nihilism. Moving on, uh, shout out to all you Northsiders out there. The North side is uh, the best of all the sides. Welcome to the world of Vikings following the murder of his dad. The Viking guy will go on a campaign and um, on the country and the men who betrayed his father. Revenge for one's parents, AKA the king, he's a prince. Um, strong men beating the crap out of each other. Shirts off, muscles, all that stuff. The only thing that would have caused a hard pause Hard pass was the fact that the director also did The Lighthouse. So if you like The Lighthouse, watch yet another one of those art house type films that, um, you know, that you can pretend to like and get all your film nerds to like it. I honestly believe that when a movie has rewatchability, then it's best. You know, you don't know when a movie has a cult, is a cult classic until later. Has anyone ever watched that movie, Overlord? Up next, we got The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, or as everyone else calls it, Nicolas Cage, The Nicolas Cage Story. It stars Nicolas Cage, of course, because modern media has been making fun of everything and everything he's done at this point, so why not just pay him to be himself on screen? Um, you know, so anyways, the whole premise of it is that a rich guy pays him to show up and adventures happen around him. So it's kind of like, it's like, you, it's like you write a story about a character and it's like, oh, this character is going to be like the biggest character ever. It's going to be wonderful. Then when they show up, it's like, oh, it's, uh, he's just going to just kind of react to the everything else happening around him rather than actually uh, driving the story. So the story kind of happens around him. Hence, this movie kind of feels like it's a derivative of one of those kind of like buddy uh, comedy movies where they get in way over their head. So anyways, uh, enjoy yet. Uh, Another, another narcissistic approach to yet another meta movie that they think we'll all like just because. All right, up next we have an animated movie for the kids. It's called The Bad Guys. From Anamorphic Animals comes a movie about animals that are not that cute trying to survive in a human world too. It's kind of like Bojack Horseman, but with less drama and comedy and plot. This is basically a movie about thieves that get caught and by blaming society they are given a chance to turn over a new leaf only for them to go from bad to worse. You try to do the right thing, uh, bad things still happen. You have one of the bad guys, who's probably the second one in command, who's just like, I'm the worst bad guy, so you have to defeat me to prove that you're not as bad as the rest of us bad guys, and so on and so forth. They have a reckoning, they turn over a new leaf, most of them, except for like the secondary main bad guy who is just like, you're not as bad as I remember you, and he's just like, well, yeah, maybe I wasn't. I don't want to be the bad guy. It's like, Ugh. and then, yeah, I don't know, dude. It's 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 a movie that it's been seen many times before. Hmm. Okay. So speaking of a movie that many of you have probably seen before, this whole month I've been showing a bunch of those old cowboy movies, and here is yet another Roy Rogers movie called, from the 1943 movie Silver Spurs. I'm not mad. Oh, I'm sorry, but can you tell by my tone that my hands are on my hips right now? Ma'am. Lynette, please, you have to listen to me. I just want to know one thing. Why don't you tell me the information that I need to know about the stock market? Uh, but ma'am, that's insider trading. I can't just tell you what's going to be on the stock market. Uh, besides, um, we might be being investigated right now. We're just making too much money. Well, I've paid pretty much everyone off that needs to be paid off. Well, that may be true, ma'am, but people might be listening to this, and this is bad. Not as bad as what happened to the last guy. What? Oh, yeah, uh, no. there's more guys than just you. No, you can't just do that. That's impossible. No, you need me. Uh, no, I don't. I need you as much as I need these stocks. A lot, as in, no, 180. Jokes. All right, I might have this uh, new stock that's about to go public. Me like you. And you want to get on the ground floor for this thing. It's a game changer. All right, sign me for as much stock as I can get without raising any eyebrows, okay? And besides, I really appreciate what you've done for me today. All right, I'll send over the paperwork with the courier, okay? You can sign the checks later. Okay. Hmm. Well, what is it? Well, chaps, looks like we got our guy, or gal. She's inside her trading, and I caught her dead to rights. Well, how much do you think you got on her, hombre? That's piqued your interest all of a sudden. We have enough evidence to fill that ten-gallon hat of yours. Oh, burn! And still come up with more than we need for this case. What are you trying to say? I'm saying, your hat's really big. <laughs> Hey 
Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for your city council report. Uh, first and foremost, the very first thing I wanted to kind of mention as well is that uh, the mayor, John Ingen, was in attendance and he uh, talked a little bit more about his treatment as he was diagnosed with cancer over a month ago. And this is uh, John Ingen. Um, I am currently uh, receiving uh, chemotherapy treatment. I have infusions uh, every Friday morning for three weeks, then I get a week off, then I have infusions for another three weeks. And ultimately, we will uh, do another uh, scan to see if uh, the poison is shrinking the tumors, which is the goal at this point, and we'll continue to see progress. I can tell you, based on the way I feel, that um, the poison is doing something because uh, the, 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 the rest of me sure feels that um, I have some days that are better than others, but I am incredibly grateful to the community for all of the support. All right. Best of luck, Mr. Mayor. As uh, we get dive deeper into the uh, city council, uh, we talk a little bit about this comprehensive zoning in the Grant Creek area, which the city plans to pass an ordinance. To the subject property consists of two parcels and approximately 44 acres in size. So the big point is that's 44 acres like 10 acres shy of what you would see with the Mullen Bill project, which is going to be a huge project, but this is potential housing stock anywhere from, and this rezoning is basically going to allow for uh, housing stock to go anywhere between 29 and 87 dwelling units. So, um, R.T. Cox, uh, president of Friends of Grant Creek, brings up concerns about the increase of traffic as a result of the increased housing stock. And this is R.T. Cox. Those of you that are familiar with issues having to do with the rezoning in Grant Creek know that traffic is a very important item. Uh, it is a great concern to people just because of narrowness of the road and the narrowness of the streets and the lack of patrol and this, would, this rezoning would essentially double the population of Grant Creek. So for all of those reasons, the traffic report is important and when the city engineer criticized the traffic report and requested a new one, that to us seemed like an important matter. Yes, uh, so one of the things is that, you know, there's a lot of potential for uh, growth in traffic and growth like that, and there's not many ways to get in and out of the uh, Grant Creek area in just in general. Um, they also mentioned that a couple, uh, they've, they've, they've mentioned this many, many, many times before, and the road itself isn't necessarily bad, but it is very windy, twisting and turning, and there's, there's a lot of potential for housing stock on some of those open lands area in the area, but at the same time, you know, with the traffic and everything going like that, they had a fire a couple of years ago and it did a lot of gridlock in terms of cars trying to flee the fires that were up in Grant Creek a couple of years ago. So the road itself isn't bad. Uh, Dave de Grand Prix Development Services on behalf of council spoke uh, about this uh, process and how they're rezoning it. The traffic impact study is not a required component of a rezoning application. It's something that is required uh, by the engineering department in certain circumstances. For example, when development will generate 200 or more vehicle trips per day. And so um, the traffic impact study, it, it's certainly, a, I guess it, you could call it an element of the application, but, but it wasn't required by our office. It was submitted in support of the application. I guess uh, it's quite typical that a rezoning application doesn't include a traffic impact study. And so um, I think it was submitted to provide more, more information. So as building permits might be issued, if improvements are necessary to Expo Parkway or Stonebridge Road or Grant Creek Road, um, then those improvements can be made by the developer at certain milestones. In other words, after a certain number of units, uh, dwelling units are, are under consideration for permit. But it's, it wasn't required by development services to move forward with the application. Hmm. So in a lot of ways, the city will get to it if they have to get to it. But in this particular case, this, um, these new dwelling units and rezoning has nothing to do with the road and has everything to do with just improving the housing stock. So as much as we want to improve our streets, housing development and transportation never really go hand in hand. A lot of times you need roads to get to your homes, but the roads adjacent to properties rarely see an upgrade in conjunction. However, there is uh, all this rezoning, which would let developers make homes, not roads, unfortunately. This kind of goes back to kind of like River Road, a couple uh, uh, weeks ago I mentioned that River Road is having a new project and a lot of citizens came out and spoke in length about just how dangerous the road is just off of the uh, uh, subject property in which they rezoned. So however you can expect a homeowner to also hold other hats 
like road and long range transportation plans, even getting developers to make sidewalks is difficult, which is why the city uses SIDs and TIF funding to leverage development. Developers are not required to build infrastructure unless it is within their best interest, hence the TIF tax breaks um, stuff. But besides rezoning doesn't have a uh, direct say in how roads are developed, Cox again responds to those arguments. And, and so traffic isn't something that gets kicked down the road later to be addressed during the building permit stage, which is what Mr. Matthews' report says. He noted in his report that this report, the traffic report was coming in late and that it would be dealt with in the building permit process. I don't see how this council in good conscience can review this proposal against these mandatory Without considering traffic issues. Okay, so that was R.T. Cox. Uh, he was the president of the, Gra the Friends of Grant Creek, and he was talking about this. But overall, this seems to uh, just slow things down. But the wheels are in motion as they put this on land use and planning. Uh, they want to develop housing and increase the housing stock. And while a traffic study is useful, it will not be it will not affect this process in rezoning. That doesn't mean traffic is not an issue, but perhaps bring this issue up during in development properties, and even they can be and and maybe even though even that can be difficult as well so um, up next we're going to talk a little bit about the final consideration of the sewer water for the mall and bill project the city needs to do this before they put the roads slash houses on the site in the mullen area this is a, an area in which is being developed um, 13 million dollars of the build grant they're also looking to raise another uh, tw uh, 10 million dollars through the raise funds which is part of the build back better murder Becerra says that she's in favor of this uh, process in terms of putting down water and sewer for this new site. Um, I just wanted to say that I believe this is an equitable and more expedient way of expanding infrastructure and extending services to a really fast developing, development, developing area of town. Um, through this water and sewer special development fee uh, for the area, the city will be able to recuperate um, funds at the time the parcels in the area develop. Um, and to me, that seems like a fair process and a, a proactive way to direct growth in this area. So for all those reasons, I'll be in support of it. And kind of going back to what they were mentioning as well, Logan McGinnis, the, uh, the lead engineer who gave the presentation on this uh, project, it says that uh, this will not affect any uh, payments. It will not take out of the general fund. They have it part of their enterprise fund. So this is fund that uh, they get through rate payers. They save up for any kind of rainy day kind of fund, no pun intended for the water company. But, uh, you know, uh, it's e easy to say that there's uh, much not, not much debate over this new neighborhood with some of the build money that's used for the roads and sidewalks. But unfortunately, they are not able to get the federal grants to build in the water and sewer. So the city is going to, uh, well, the city by proxy um, through the Public Works uh, Missoula's Water Company will have to pay for it. But this is an investment because there's going to be so many houses that, and development there that the new rate payers that are going to be there are going to quickly recoup a lot of the costs associated with that. But at the same time, they also uh, mentioned that um, the uh, the developers are going to be in charge of the main that uh, runs underneath the house so they can hook up to the bigger water system. So that's kind of how they've always done it, and that's how the water company has always kind of moved with that as well. So zoning reads it, it its old head once again as the city updates zoning changing in um, changing the review and decision-making authority for public forum from the Board of Adjustments to the City Council. So this was actually a legislation uh, on the state level, so powers are going to be adjusted, and Emily Gluckin is going to talk a little bit more about this state law. So recently during the 2021 legislative session, the state passed House Bill 496, which specifically revised uh, that section of state regulations that discuss, discusses public forums. Um, the bill changed the review authority for public forums from the Board of Adjustment to uh, the local governing body, which in Missoula's case is the City Council. All right, so you're going to be seeing a lot more of City Council talking about rezoning here and there. Board adjustments can uh, mostly in the past have been... Uh, <laughs> I, I hate to say this, but it's just like, is that sign up to code? Uh, is that size big enough or is that too small? Or is that a little too big for a sign? 
in, in advertising and stuff like that. So it's, it's interesting about that, but she goes into a little bit more. But the gist of what they're doing is uh, reacting to a state law and putting zoning authority towards the city, and subsequently the Board of Adjustment will just have input, but no comprehensive changes when it comes to zoning. The city of Missoula has been handling a good chunk of zoning, and, the, uh, and of course the county is doing a major overhaul on how they're rezoning uh, the county of Missoula. So look out for that. Uh, it's going to be part of planning board, and they're talking a little bit more about this to kind of uh, pick up the slack for uh, the county commissioners so they can get um, educated and know exactly how they're going to go about this process. So um, that's kind of what's happening there, but let's talk about Missoula's investment with the Community Land Trust. So one of the things is uh, this is part of the north side Scott Street development. The city has some uh, uh, subsequent property there. And so with this land trust, they're hoping to keep the costs down for uh, people who will want to move to the north side. And here is Heidi West, uh, who is a ward one, who is a representative of the uh, north side neighborhoods. And for the purpose of this OI, um, affordable home ownership units means units targeting buyers with an annual income of 120% of the area median income or less. Um, and I think um, that currently, I think that is the expectation of who this property will serve. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in support of issuing this loan so we can figure out how to reach those goals. All right. So uh, the city is working in conjunction with Rivara, and Rivara is the lead developer on the site, in which we're working in conjunction with the city of Missoula and improving this particular area. So it's a it's a small amount of acreage, about nine or so acres, nine to you know ten, uh, roughly on the north side on Scott Street Bridge, and there uh, the city has a lot more input because it's the city owned property. So they're going to be able to leverage a lot of affordable housing, especially in that particular area. Sandra Vasica, council member, was on board until this round of checks, and this is what she had to say. When this first came about last year, uh, I spoke really deeply and uh, for hours about this with Heather Harp. Um, her, her earlier uh, today during public comment, she was a former city councilor, and she changed my mind about the land trust option, and so I'm not against that. Uh, I do think it's a very interesting idea, and it will um, uh, benefit a lot of folks. I just am really uncomfortable with, uh, with the loan parameters on this, and uh, these are taxpayer dollars, and I just am uncomfortable with um, using our taxpayer dollars to be in the loaning business. So that, that's why I'm against this too. All right, and so that was uh, that was the argument there. Um, the uh, the crisis in housing is high, and the city wants to take on this risk and make a model that can benefit those struggling now and trying to uh, get past some red tape. But then again, throwing money at a problem may not stick. But then again, not throwing money at this issue may not does nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, of course, as of Monday this week, the emergency uh, winter warming shelter closed uh, just at the heels of an intense cold snap that has been basically the last and last two weeks. And we're only going to start getting some warmer temperatures in the 60s starting on Monday, which, you know, in Missoula, it's like Sunday. So, you know, anyways, Dar Daniel Carlino, uh, council member, is worried about those leaving the emergency winter shelter and that the city should do more. Johnson emergency winter shelter closing today. Um, there's going to be a lot of people in Missoula that are looking for somewhere to stay, and we frankly just don't have enough beds for everybody to stay. Um, and uh, just looking at the Martin v. Boise ruling, it says that cities cannot enforce anti-camping ordinances or laws um, if we do not have enough homeless shelter beds available for the homeless population. Um, so I just think it's something that the law enforcement needs to be contacted about, and it just should be um, something that we re reflect on that that we saw this coming a mile away, and then here we are on the day of the shelter closing, and there's no solutions. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of uh, calls to the police just uh, guaranteed at this point, just people uh, uh, trespassing on certain properties and stuff like that. It's it's usually common amongst these uh, um, as we're transitioning out of the uh, winter warming shelter. Um, the city uh, did what they could with the temporary winter shelter, but then again, it was a reaction to an outcry of Missoula citizens. Perhaps more people in Missoula will speak up on the homeless uh, folks' behalf, maybe find a solution, not this temporary winter warming shelter. So up next, we got some community meetings. Uh, I don't have a clip for you guys. We're going to kind of give you a little bit of information about they're talking about the uh, poplar farm and irrigation from all these trees that recycle and absorb nitrates in the wastewater. So this is a comprehensive update uh, with this poplar farm next to the wa wastewater treatment plant that has been very beneficial at, at uh, a natural resource when it comes to keeping the Clark 
Fork River clean. Another big item was that the Missoula plans to use satellite imagery to actually pinpoint the leakage in our water system. This is very beneficial because back before the city owned the water company, we hired a third firm to uh, do an inspection and it yielded results of, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but they uh, mentioned in a uh, um, in a metaphor, which is about nine football fields worth of leakage annually. So there's a lot of leakage happening in, in Missoula, but at the same time, the pump system is good. And, um, and back in the day uh, when Carlisle uh, owned, the, uh, owned um, the Mountain Water Company, they said, it's like, hey, if, if you turn on the water, that should be good enough. That was their uh, argument against that. So there's some um, information right that. This is going to cost $27,000 to determine the satellite imagery with the leakage system. It's going to be part of the Enterprise Fund. So Missoula Water will foot the bill, hence the uh, rate pay payers as well. So anyways, um, so... Um, that's basically what I had to say about that. I didn't dive too deep in the community meetings, but I wanted to kind of uh, give you an overview in which you guys can find out more information about that and more by going on to ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful website for everything you need to know about what's going on in the government. You can get involved with the city of Missoula. You can join boards. You can uh, volunteer. Just a lot of opportunities. And also, it's a great resource for uh, people to uh, tell uh, the city of Missoula if there's a pothole in your neighborhood. It's like, oh, this road sucks. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, but <laughs> but then you know, like every time I see a road and anything like I've seen, ever seen something like that, they do a patch and seal deal, and so this is part of their because um, they have all the equipment that they need. They just don't uh, actively go around to uh, check the streets and be like, hmm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's something that you guys can do as well to get involved with your own city government, ci.missoula.mt.us. All right, up next we have an art clip featuring Marcus Ammerman, and this is a uh, Native American art that's featured at the Missoula Art Museum. And so without further ado, here is a little clip of this, and when we come back we're going to talk about a lot of things happening this weekend, which includes the kickoff for the International Wildlife Film Festival. <music> Hey guys, welcome back. Hey, if you guys don't go to the Museum Art Museum, I won't be mad. I'll just be very disappointed in you. All right. <laughs> Speaking of events that are happening in the city of Missoula, let's kick things off with the Mountain Line Route Race. So this is part of the Mountain Line Public Transit. Launching Earth Week, Montana Line, Mountain Line will host a week-long Amazing Race style route race. Missoulians are encouraged to try their hand at solving clues as they use the bus venture across Missoula, earning a grand prize entry for their final check-in location. Route Race participants will receive their first clue Monday morning, April 18th at 8 a.m. by visiting Mountain Line's website. This is an ongoing event that's going on all week long. Uh, there are five check-in locations in the race. In order to earn the an entry to the grand prize drawing, racers must check in at all the spots by Saturday, tomorrow night, uh, by midnight. The grand prize package includes the following prizes generously donated by local businesses. You know, $25 gift card, Western Montana fair t-shirt poster, and all sorts of tickets. Um, One-year membership of Run Wild Missoula, 
uh, Rock and Rudy's Hydro Flask, uh, Five Punch Pass to the Roxy Theater, and Mountain Lion Swag. So a lot of great stuff happening there. It's going to be ongoing throughout this weekend. Um, it's going to be pretty cool. It's uh, they did a couple of these as well with the uh, 420 on Wednesday, where if you go to a couple of dispensaries, you can go enter into a drawing, which they had a, a block party a couple days ago. Um, so it's a, a couple. Uh, Yep, it's uh, yeah, Main Street. Whatever. Who cares? It's done. It's past. No one cares about the past. We're about the future. All right, let's talk about some library stuff. As always, the Yarns and Watercolor are at noon on the fourth floor of the library. They're one of the most ongoing and popular events within the city of Missoula. And I, yes, I mean that because I've been up there before. Over 30 people are in there doing the watercolor slash, you know, yarns and stitching and crocheting and all sorts of things up there all around noon um, on the fourth floor of the public library. Um, so one of the things I also wanted to mention is the Lifelong Learning Center. They're doing Excel, Microsoft Excel Level 2. So it uh, helps you make graphs and stuff like that. And you can actually be proficient in Excel like you lie on your resume. Um, in Power Place, open play hours is going to be at the Food Bank. So this is, uh, this is uh, in conjunction with the Missoula Public Library, Spectrum Discovery Center, and it's going to all be happening at the Missoula Food Bank. They have these uh, um, readings and talks and stuff like that, kind of like their own little tiny tales. Um, and of course, this, uh, the library here in Missoula has their own tiny tales at 10.30 uh, a.m. Uh, both Tiny Tales and Storytime, Fridays and Saturdays. So, uh, seventh annual Ceramic Invitational starting at 11 today. Every week there is something new for six weeks until mid-May. Radius Gallery has a new art gallery ins installation, Ceramics Invitational, as they lead up into um, more and more uh, pottery-themed uh, uh, things happening this weekend, and which includes that uh, gala, which I'll get to when I talk about Saturday events. Earth Day Trial Cleanup, Natural Garden at Five Valleys Land Trust. Join Five Valley Land Trust with a partnership with the Working Dogs for Cons Conservation and Tough Your Pet Outfitters for Dog Waste Cleanup in honor of Earth Day. Beginning at 2 p.m. this afternoon, head to one of these heavily used trails. Sunlight on North Hills, Maurice on Mount Sentinel, Bar Meyer on Mount Dean Stone, Blue Mountain Trailhead, and, um, and Lincoln Hills on Mount Jumbo to help pick up dog waste and trash. Afterwards, receive uh, uh, reconvene at 5 p.m. at the Natural Garden outside Five Valleys, which is at 120 Hickory Street, for an Earth Day celebration with snacks, drinks, and raffle drawings. So a lot of fun stuff like happening like that. Council of All Beans, uh, as we get into the International Wildlife Film Festival, there's going to be a lot of animal theme type stuff, and this is the Council of All Beans. Join the family. Families of the Livable Climate in Cooper Room A401 of the Missoula Public Library for a Council of All Beings, an intergenerational arts and ecology event brought by the brought to us by the works of that reconnects that reconnects and facilitates by Penelope um, Baccaro. In this council, we gather to speak on behalf of non-human world and receive their gifts to continue on healing and protecting our planet. And that's gonna be on the fourth floor of the library. All right, so so they're going to do an, a debut show. Uh, so let's see here. Hmm. Earth Day. Oh yeah. So this is. Uh, oh, let me see. Let's see. Where is that forest? An ongoing represent responsive art project inspired by nature. This can be at Suite Two, which is. Oh man, I'm. I'm losing it here. This is on uh, w uh, 1011 South 4th Street West, Missoula, Montana, next to uh, uh, Rose Park. And they're going to do uh, this event from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, in the house off of Rose Park. And the film screening is at 7 p.m. Forest debuts, responsive art inspired by nature. Call and response, art and poetry by um, um, Marissa Litch and Christina Howe. Animated short film uh, featuring vi videography by Andrew Snyder, Meet the Ocean, and Mark Piper, and music by Chris Lee. Uh, there's prints, local beer and wine, and have good vibes of celebration our planet. Um, a portion of proceeds will be donated to local community fund. In-person donations accepted with, without purchase. All right, anyways, Project Earth, music, science, uh, Philosophy Action. So, wow, that's an interesting title. But uh, the University of Montana and the Denison Theater is hosting an event like any other. Project Earth fuses science, music, philosophy, and a lo a local activism into one impactful evening starting at 7.30 p.m. at the Denison Theater. You guys can check it out by going to MissoulaEvents.net. Up next, we got some Saturday events. Missoula Valley Winter Market starting at 9 a.m. Southgate Mall. They also have Orchard Homes. This is from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Great way for you to get involved with the farmer's market as you gear up for the uh, farmer's markets will be happening in downtown, 
downtown starting in May. So make a mask for Wild Walk. So Missoula Public Library is hosting um, uh, an event where you do arts and crafts on the second floor of the Missoula Public Library. You're going to make your own mask when you do the Wild Walk, which is going to happen at the first interstate bank building. And they're going to go from there down Higgins, uh, through the Wild Walk Wild Fest on their way to Roxy Theater, which has been hosting the, uh, the, uh, the event for many, many years now. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about Wild Walk if I have enough time at the end of the show, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about MUD, which is the Missoula Urban Demonstration Project, and they're doing an Earth Day celebration with their, at their MUD tool library, which is just behind uh, Home Resource. And, uh, and will honor a showcase of uh, Missoula's vibrant sustainability culture. And the festival will feature an environmental expo activities and workshops for children and adults and education programs and much as food, drinks, and local music. Uh, we'll once be hosting the 2022 Festival at MUD, Home Resource, and adjacent properties. So, all right, let's see. Wild Fest begins when we get to the, uh, the Red X's and officially kicks off the 2022 Film Festival of Music and Food Truck Cap off the morning before the films begin rolling. Uh, while uh, Wild Fest performances is going to start at noon at the, uh, the plaza, it's called the BN Plaza, but it's the Red X's in the downtown Missoula area. Live performance by the Black Footed Ferret from the endangered short tales of the nearly forgotten podcast at, at by, mm, by actor and musician Noah Watts. All right, so uh, they also is doing an open tea. So starting around noon o'clock or so, uh, Missoula Art Museum is doing a teen open studio. They have snacks and other stuff and other uh, they provide art supplies for a lot of uh, teenagers interested in doing some art projects and this happens from 12:30 about 2:30 three hours but also um, uh, around um, 1 to 3 MCAT also hosts a Saturday drop-in for the kids around 8 to 14 good age for kids to do stop animation play with Legos and all sorts of fun like that as well and while they're here at the library Animal Wonders is going to be visiting the libraries in conjunction with a lot of things happening with wildlife this week. And Animal Wonders is visiting the library. They uh, take in animals and bastards of the Animal Wonders to see how to learn about wildlife they care for. The program is appropriate for school-age children and their caregivers. Space is limited and registration is required. And uh, you can register online at Animal Wonders um, at eventbrite.com. Then again, you can always find this on MissoulaEvents.net. All right. For 45 years, the International Wildlife Film Festival has been uh, kicking off and doing things in the city of Missoula. And basically, from April 23rd through the 30th, for a whole week long, you guys get to enjoy many, 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 many films and documentaries about animals. According to this, you're about 20 hours away, but if you're seeing this this afternoon or watching this online, yeah, good luck figuring out those times. Anyways, uh, it's happening from Saturday and all the way until next Saturday, seven days. You can get tickets online, you can see films, there are a lot of different venues and a lot of different places to check this out. Go to wildlifefilms.org. Wow. All right, let's talk about some other things that are happening as well, is that there's a noise generation sculpture workshop here in the public library. It's going to be hosted here in our very own studio uh, just after our Saturday drop-ins. And it's a sculpture workshop for uh, uh, participants. We'll learn the history of physics of sound art through the creation of vibration, irritation, sensation, alternative instruments for sound generation and effects triggers from found or fabricated objects and supplied uh, a lot of components. Just a lot of buzzwords. So it's it's about noise generating sculptures and creating a sense of feeling through sound. I could have just said that. All right, pot sketch auction gala. So as we're going into ceramics and stuff like this over this weekend, they they're going to kick things off at uh, UC Ballroom on the third floor. Pot sketch 2022 auction gala. Pot sketch featured drawings, mixed media works, and assortment of incredible ceramic art generating. Generously donated from all over 100 local, national, and international artists. Funds raised during this pot skits are integral to helping sustain the clay study of Missoula's facilities and programs during the year. Joins for a fun field event. It's $70, $75 for a ticket and $700 for a table of 10. So quite a night of auction, buying and selling and all that stuff. So wild night for wildlife. Montana Naturally Center Center is back with its uh, two years far from a few wild nights. They're ready to change that. Come and join an evening of a good food live and silent auction raffles and supporting local conservation efforts and local archery range. So this is going to be provided by Hellgate Archery Range at Big Sky Park. Enjoy the fun. All right, so here are your late night events happening on Saturday. You got Sean Burris at 6 p.m. Imagination Brewing Company. Much like Charlie, Charlie's going to be at DraftWorks at 6 p.m. on Saturday. 
Dan Cummins. It's going to be a Symphony of Insanity tour. It's going to be at the Wilma at 7 p.m. Live music with Modified Lockdown, Cranky Sand Public House at 7 p.m. Uh, Kadabra, uh, Comic Sans DJ Gaba is going to be at Monk's <laughs> at 7 p.m. I don't know. DJ Club Music, whatever. Uh, Montana <laughs> Fishing Film Festival. Hey, any, besides, anybody watching this is not a clubber. Like, anyways. Anyways, now in our fifth year, now in the ninth year, Montana F Fishing Film Festival at the University of Montana come experience the best homegrown films, English from all walks of life, fishing close to their own backyards and freshwater destinations. The lineup in phenomenal uh, this year, and we cannot wait to see you at the annual community building event. Get those tickets. Uh, the door is open at 6. The show is at 7 p.m. It's at the University of Montana. Solid Snake Karaoke is going to be at Westside Lanes Fun Center at 9 p.m. Benevolence is going to be playing some music at the Union Hall. DJ Chris Moon every Saturday at the Badlander. All right, so if I have enough time, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, films with the uh, Wildlife Film Festival. So you get a, an array of different films. Um, the White Dream, it's 2022 selection. Looks like it's about a, a, a mountain goat. Uh, you have bison, uh, American horses, a lot of fun stuff like Attenborough, Wonder of Song, uh, just a lot of different uh, uh, international films that are going to be playing. A lot of great stuff, as you can see. Wow. Yeah, so, it, wow, it just keeps on loading. It just keeps on loading. But like I said, it's going to be uh, wildlife films, wild, wildlifefilms.org. So you got to check that out. You can see all the lineups, see them all on there as well, kicking off tomorrow. And you can't, you don't want to miss it. So. I think that's pretty much it for me. Uh, I don't have much more to say about what's happening in the city of Missoula. I have a little bit of time, so I'm going to um, let you guys go. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp.